So last month, we had a guest here at Grace for a couple of days. Uh, he is the chaplain for the Indianapolis Colts. He's also a pastor in the Indianapolis area of a sister church of ours. He said, would you mind if I just come a shadow for a couple of days? And I said, oh, that'd be great. Yeah, come on over. And, and I asked him, I said, tell me about, I know the pastoring thing a little bit, but tell me about being the chaplain for the Indianapolis Colts. What is that like? And he talked about how he's been doing it for over 20 years, started in his late 20s, um, and how he, he just shepherds these guys, uh, you know, through some of the challenges that they face uh, with a lot of fame and money and all the rest, and, and uh, leads uh, Bible studies. And, and he told me, he said, on, before a game, he said, I'll pray with 35, 40 players and coaches individually. I said, well, what are some of the challenges? He said, uh, when guys retire. I said, really? Like, how so? And he said, when guys take off their jersey for the last time, and they're never going to play again. He says, many of them don't know who they are apart from that jersey. They've been known as a stud athlete, many of them since elementary school. They've always succeeded. They've always been at the top of the To be in the NFL, you have to be this amazing athlete. And when they take off that jersey, a lot of them don't know who they are. He said, here's the fallout of that. He said, within three years after a guy retires from the NFL, 68% of them, three, one of three things happens, or more than one. Bankrupt, divorced, or unemployed and looking for work. He said, that's the challenge of you take off the jersey, you don't know who you are. Many of them. So it's press Friday, I'm doing a wedding, and, and I met this guy who was a Marine, uh, and he served for five years now, he's in a civilian job, and he comes to Grace occasionally. In fact, John, if you're here today, really glad you're here. He said, what are you speaking about? So I'm talking about how to make your life count, like how to have roots that go deep so that whatever comes your way, you're going you're gonna to be Okay. And I told him the story about the NFL players, and he goes, man, he goes, it's exactly the same in the military. I go, really? He said, yeah. I was at five years in the Marines. He said, when I took off my uniform, he said, that next year of my life was the hardest year of my life. Because you've been in this, you know, camaraderie and all the rest, and you've been defined by that, and now you don't have that, and who are you? Now, you might be going like, man, I'm glad my job doesn't make me wear a uniform or a jersey, because I'm like, I'm... but isn't it true that no matter what you wear to the office, that a lot of folks, when they take off the jersey of their role, it could be that they're in management, it could be that they teach in a school, they're a coach, you could be a parent, and kids all leave the home, and all of a sudden you go, who am I? Who am I? It might be that your health is stripped from you, and you go, wow, I was so healthy, and all of a sudden this thing hit. Or a relationship, someone walks out on you. It could be that you, you, you lose friendship or you, you lose a house or you move out of the area or something. Do you have an identity that goes deeper than those outer fixtures in your life? When you take off the jersey of whatever that might be, do you know who you are? You know there's a way we can know who we are? That no matter what is taken away from us, what storms of life come? That we can be people who are rooted and planted and strong and that life counts. How do we do that? Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, not so the wicked. They are like the chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You see a picture here. People are, they call it winnowing or threshing the wheat, and they sort of throw it up in the air, and the wheat is heavier and falls to the ground. The chaff just blows away, right? Because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a visual guy. I like the way the Bible says it. I thought, well, let's, let's do it. He says that our lives are either like a tree, planted, rooted, life-giving. This tree doesn't have fruit, but eventually a tree, is just, you bear fruit. You, or our lives are like chaff. They're just sort of, they're lifeless. They're, they're not meant for much good. And, and here's the problem. 
When the storms of life come, and invariably they will, we live in a broken world, they're going to come to everybody. Uh, here's what happens. So this tree, right, what happens? The storms of life come, that tree's going to be fine, that tree's going nowhere, right? But what happens to the chaff? The storm comes, it's no match for the storms of life. And the great thing is this, all of us can be like a tree. A life that counts with joy and impact comes from choosing to feed my life with God's Word. Simple as that, right? Powerful little phrase there in verse 3. It says, like a tree planted. There's something proactive about that. There's an intentionality. A tree that's planted. Where? By streams of water. The health of a tree, the flourishing of a tree will be in direct proportion to the health of its roots. Whatever you see above, there's that much underneath, and that's the secret to this tree having life. If this tree's not bearing fruit, you know, and a person comes out and goes, you are stupid leaves and you branches, you don't know what you're doing, you can't even bear a piece of fruit, what's wrong with you? First of all, he looks sort of weird to do that, but secondly, <laughs> if you argue with the leaves or with the branches, you're, you're addressing the wrong part, Right? You address the what? You go after the roots, right? Because the health of the roots will directly affect the health of the rest of the plant. How do we do that? Verse 2, he says, whose delight is in what? In the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. If you're wondering what it means to meditate, think of worry. Worry is meditating on your problems, it's the same as meditating, but meditating is thinking over and over again about like, wow, God, when you say that right there, like there will be a verse that God will just sort of speak to me and, and I'll go, wow, I keep on coming back to that over and over again. You're, you're meditating on it. You gain hope from its comfort. You find wisdom in its direction. You're corrected by its rebukes. You stake your life on its promises. You don't just obey the Bible. You don't just listen to it. He says there, he says, who delights in the law. Like we actually, you, you say, man, I, I can't wait. You think of how we delight in certain kinds of food, right? If you're a Schaefer, you delight in ice cream, right? That's just part of our family's DNA. Like not to have ice cream in the freezer is like not having water coming out of the spigot or something like that, you know. It's, we delight in ice cream. You delight in, in God's Word. You say, God, I, I want to take this in. But there's something different. When you delight in God's Word, it's not this like inanimate kind of, this is a letter from none other than the ultimate author himself, God, the one who made you and created you, loves you, and he goes, I, I want to be in relationship with you. And to be in relationship with God means that his word is just feeding our, our souls. So we delight in the word because we delight in the person behind the word.